Um, yep, so hello, I'm Eberhard, I'm from Salzburg, and apparently so I'm talking about how to understand source code with visualization, and apparently I'm not the only one talking about visualization today, so it seems like it's an interesting topic. And um, I'm also working on a tool named SourceTrail, um, but th this talk is more about the fundamentals of why visualization really works. Um, so the story usually starts with a developer writing some code, and then later on others need to understand it, which is not much fun. And if we uh, think of it in terms of information theory, it really is encoding and decoding of information. And in our industry, we sort of we lean towards the right in time spent. Um, Software developers spend a lot more of their time on reading and understanding source code that's already written than on writing new one, and that's a problem. Like, if we can make it more efficient to read source code, we can save a lot of time. So, if we take a look at source code, um, what it really is is textual data, and it has a high information density. So, and that's a good thing because it's very efficient to write it and to express um, functionality. But by just looking at it, you don't really get much information out of it, like what types and methods exist. You, you, ne you need to look at the words and you make the connections in your head. We have like syntax highlighting and white spacing rules to um, help ourselves, but it's not really the best way to uh, process information for our brains. And so what is good for our brains? Um, let's take a look at information visualization. Information visualization takes some um, visual variables like position, size, color, and um, en uses those to encode information. And um, some of them have a, a very special characteristic. They are pre-attentive. That means um, by just looking at these groups, you see the one that sticks out immediately. You, you don't even need to think about it. It's like, you know, it's like a, a const expression compiled right into your brain. And if we can, <laughs> if we can make use of this in um, reading information, then we are super fast. Um, and then there's also the Gestalt laws, which um, um, they sort of give us some, um, they show how we, um, we see objects as belonging together into a group. Um, and all of this was already put lots into practice in software visualization as well. And um, Stefan Diehl wrote a book on how this, um, which approaches exist. And he um, came up with these um, three main types, which is visualizing structure, behavior, and evolution of software. And so what I'm talking about is uh, structure visualization. And this works by um, using static analysis on the source code, and then um, mostly visualizing it using a graph, which is notes and um, they're just connecting those. And um, if we go back to our sample, like if we want to come up with a simple notation that expresses all everything that is in this code, we need to define what are our nodes and what are our edges. And for nodes, we can choose like our symbol types, like type, function, and variable. And then the edges will be how they um, talk to each other. So a simple notation could like use colors for type, function, and variable in gray yellow and blue because color works really well for distinguishing and then for um, for members we could use containment um, in, in classes which uh, sort of gives the um, the hierarchy very easily and um, the for the edges we re reuse the same color so when accessing a variable we use blue accessing a function is yellow and using a type is gray and um, for inheritance we use the known um, UML the big arrow which everyone knows um, for templates, we need to tie together a template class and the um, the argument type and create this uh, specialization type in the middle. And um, so if we then use this on our code sample, um, we have an immediate uh, picture of what's in there. Like gray is the type nodes that exist. Then in yellow, we see all the functions and the whole call graph. And if we look at the blue um, variables and where they access. And so, um, in this way, we can we can retrieve information at a glance, but it's not enough to have just a visualization. You always need the code as well, um, and the visualization has also one great advantage. It really it, it it has it can bring together information that is spread in all of your code base, and um, but some of you might still think, yeah, right, okay, but how will this work on a real big code base, and how? How um, how is that going to work to help me? And um, I don't have time to get into this now. But um, so the tool I'm working on is Source Trail, and with with it we really try to make this happen. To have uh, uh, diagrams generated on the fly that show you 
um, like how the one thing you're currently looking at connects to your whole code base. And um, you can download and use that. And to answer the question before, it also shows include graphs, but it doesn't do the, the project context yet. But all right, thank you. Yes? What is the input to your tool? Is it just because like C++ code is not self-containing? Self I mean, you need always some sort of configuration where to look for the dependencies and so on and so on. What, how, do you, how do you deal with that? So the question was, um, what, what's the input to our tool to um, understand all the, um, uh, the code? Um, so we use the uh, Clang lib tooling, which um, gives the um, which creates the C++ abstract syntax tree, uh, which you can traverse for all the information. And in terms of configuration, um, easiest thing is if you have a Clang compilation database, which you can export from CMake. And we also have a plugin that exports it from Visual Studio. And um, it contains all source files and include paths, and that way you have all the information. But you have to need to have a valid CMake configuration. Yes. Okay. Yes. How do you mark the control flow? I mean, in the example before, you had like a function and an, o an object and a function in main, and you had like three arrows going out of main. How do you understand from your diagram what's the order of it? We actually don't show the, the order of it. We show the dependency. So it's not a, yeah, it's not a dynamic analysis that knows when what happens. We also don't know, you know, if um, this if is true or false, and if uh, the first or the second one is called, we just show it potentially these functions call each other. All right, thank you. Thank you.